This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. President Biden's ordered U.S. intelligence agencies to investigate the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic and report back to him within 90 days. Biden said the U.S. intelligence community has coalesced around two likely scenarios that the virus emerged from human contact with an infected animal, or that it started spreading after an accidental leak from a Chinese lab. The first COVID cases were reported in Wuhan, China, which is also the home of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Wall Street Journal recently reported three employees of the institute fell ill with COVID-like symptoms in the autumn of 2019 and were hospitalized in November of the, uh, that year, before the first recorded case of COVID-19. On Wednesday, White House Deputy Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said the administration would press China for more information. We will continue to press China to participate in a full, transparent, evidence-based international investigation with the needed access to get to the bottom of a virus that's taken more than three million lives across the globe, and critically to share information and lessons that will help us all prevent future pandemics. China's criticized the Biden administration's call for a new probe, saying the lab leak hypothesis is a, quote, conspiracy created by U.S. intelligence agencies. In March, the World Health Organization said its investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic found it was extremely unlikely that the novel coronavirus emerged from a laboratory. But many scientists are calling on the WHO to further investigate the possibility. To talk about this and a number of other issues around the pandemic, we're joined by Dr. Monica Gandhi, infectious disease physician and professor of medicine at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Gandhi, welcome back to Democracy Now! First off, if you could address this issue, why it is significant to know about the origins um, of COVID-19, whether it was, um, you know, the virus going from animal um, to human, or whether it was an accidental leak from this virology lab? You know, I actually think it um, could still be both, right? So if we think about SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, this is now the third coronavirus in recent history that has caused severe acute respiratory syndromes in humans. The first one was 2002 early 2003, this, uh, that was called SARS. The second one was MERS in 2011. And this is the third and far worst, which is now in, it, it, we knew about it as of December 31st, 2019. All three of these viruses likely originated in bats, went through some sort of animal host and came to humans. It could still be that with SARS-CoV-2. What I think is at stake is the question of, was the, this virus known about, st been being studied in this laboratory at the Wuhan Institute of Virology prior to the world knowing about it, and then unfortunately during the study of it uh, had this lab accident where there were some people in the laboratory infected. It's not an either or, and in fact, I think it is quite difficult to design a virus. I mean, this has been constantly thought about with HIV and other viruses. It's difficult for humans to create what, what nature creates. So I'm still—Jane uh, Goodall actually has a very nice explanation of this, um, about it's really our treatment of animals that fundamentally has led to most of these infections coming into human populations. The issue at stake is, if this was known about before, it should have been told to the rest of the world prior, because things like vaccine development could have been accelerated. People would have known um, to uh, start with the isolation procedure. So there, there could have been things that had happened faster. But I, I personally do not think that you can create these type of viruses in a lab. Only nature can do this. Dr. Gandhi, I'd like to ask uh, about another issue, which is the CDC lifting restrictions uh, here in the U.S. Uh, with respect to the pandemic. Could you explain what some of those uh, these new guidelines from the CDC are and what some of the opposition uh, uh, to those uh, this lifting of restrictions is? 
Uh, many have suggested that lifting restrictions without requiring proof of vaccination uh, is a mistake. Yes. So as you indicated, it was May 13th. It was kind of a, well, it was a very surprising day. I'll say that. And this was a surprising day for actually many of us, including me, who had been talking about metrics of when you want to ease restrictions based on our vaccination rates. So to put it cleanly, it was May 13th, the White House Task Force and the CDC messaged um, a, a point in, in a quite surprising announcement that uh, those who are vaccinated don't need to wear masks and those who are unvaccinated should stay wearing masks. Now, what they cited in their press conference actually was very important which was the true science behind this, which is what we've really been seeing since the clinical trials is how incredibly effective these vaccines are. And to explain efficacy versus effectiveness, efficacy is the word that we use in clinical trials. We had all the clinical trials come out right in December. We had New England Journal papers on these vaccines that we have in this country, so-called Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and then also uh, FDA reports. And they were very efficacious in clinical trials, 95% for the Moderna and the Pfizer. But what ended up happening is all these real-world studies came out. What, how did they look like in the real world, where things are messier? People aren't always wearing masks. People are doing a variety of behaviors. They're still uh, ongoing circulating virus. And some of the studies they cited, for example, was a very large March 29th CDC MMWR study that looked at vaccine effectiveness uh, in first-line responders, healthcare workers across the nation, and vaccine effectiveness was 90%. Then they cited a JAMA study from Israel um, on May 6th that showed that effectiveness is 97%. And importantly, studied a New England, um, cited a New England Journal study from Qatar and the reason this was important is the Qatar campaign, as they were rolling out vaccine, the variants were emerging in uh, Qatar. And by the time they got to March in this campaign, it, there were about almost all of the virus was the B1351, so-called South Africa variant, B117, so-called UK variant, and still 97.4% effective in that study. So those are the three studies they cited. There are actually many more that shows that the real-world effectiveness, even in older patients, um, is very high. 95% prevention of hospitalizations in a CDC older patient study across the United States over 65 years old. They then cited a series of studies, including some of which I mentioned, but many more, that vaccines block transmission. It prevents us, if we're vaccinated, from even having infection in our nose that could lead to, even when you feel well, uh, asymptomatic transmission. That has been actually an Achilles heel of COVID-19 that we could spread it when we feel well. These vaccines block your even having asymptomatic nasal carriage so that you can't pass it on to others. And again, a series of studies showing blockage of, of asymptomatic infection and transmission by 86% to 98%. And then finally cited the breakthrough data in the United States, even with circulating virus, very, very low rates of people actually getting sick, thankfully, with COVID-19 after vaccination. Um, really, uh, it's hard to estimate, to tell you, but it's really a multiple zeros before a 9%, so 0 0.0009% uh, getting severe illness um, after you've had the vaccine. So if you put all those studies together, what they said was sound. What they said was sound. Vaccinated people don't have to wear masks. Unvac unvaccinated people, depending on the community transmission in your area, should continue to wear masks. Where this led to confusion, and I agree with the confusion, um, is, and I was not, I would never have done it this way, and I actually messaged that very publicly before this, is that it leads to this question of equity. It leads to this question of how do you figure out who's vaccinated and unvaccinated? And what I was, I and many others were advocating for was get a date in the United States. It probably would have been somewhere mid-June, maybe even July 4th, uh, President Biden's day of getting 70% first vaccination. Check that your case rates are low and then lift masking for everybody. It would have eliminated a lot of this confusion. But I really want to stress that the science is sound and I don't think transmission rates are going to go up because of unmasking of, um, of unvaccinated people who are 
uh, deliberately unmasking, but yet not uh, vaccinating. So I wanted to play for you um, uh, the head of the nation's largest nurses union, the National Nurses United, criticizing the CDC rollback on COVID protection guidance. This is NNU President Gene Ross. We at NNU believe that the uh, change in guidelines the CDC gave on wearing masks is unwarranted and it's very, very premature. For one thing, uh, we don't know yet how many uh, mutants are out there and we don't know how the vaccines are reacting with those mutations. We also know that the CDC did recognize finally that the virus is airborne. It is aerosolized and it floats through the air, but they didn't fully recognize it or we would have guidelines on ventilation and other respiratory precautions, which we don't have. So National Nurses United continues to believe that vaccines are only one portion of a good comprehensive plan to make sure this epidemic, this pandemic, does not get any worse. So that's National Nurses United President Jean Ross. Um, Dr. Monica Gandhi, if you can respond, and also, I mean, how practically, if you're walking down the street or if you're walking into a store, I mean, you're talking about a worker at a store saying, are you vaccinated, to figure out whether they should be wearing a mask, how this actually gets enforced. But start Start by responding to Jean Ross. Yes. Um, so I sympathize with the position, though there are actually um, uh, biological inaccuracies in the statement um, uh, that we just heard. So, number one, we actually do know how these vaccines work against the variants. And in fact, that's a really key point that many of us have been making since February, and now we're into May. But when I cited the Qatar campaign that I just told you, that really was real world data beyond a lot of work that um, we've all been talking about, that T cells, which is another arm of your immune system, were never thought that they wouldn't work against the variants. We now have great data just from this week that B cells, which are your other arm of your immune system, can actually evolve and produce antibodies to variants. So um, the, the real world story on how these vaccines work against variants is very, very heartening. Um, and absolutely the vaccines work against the variants. The second is, um, it's true that there's confusion around aerosol versus droplet. It's important to say that many of us in the ID community want to get away from this discussion of the size of the particle and talk about the mitigation strategies that are most effective for a certain virus. It is true that masking, distancing, and ventilation have different roles to play depending on the type of infectious agent. And it's not as clear cut as something is an aerosol and thus you need an N95 mask and something is droplet and distance matters. It is actually a a sort of non-pharmaceutical interventional triangle, and all three matter. And then the other thing that I need to say about what, what the, the statement said is that actually vaccines are not one more tool in the toolkit. Um, if, if they were just a tool, uh, India would be doing much better than they are now. The five tools for SARS-CoV-2 prior to vaccines are masking, distancing, ventilation, contact tracing, and testing. It's all we had before vaccines. Vaccines are the solution. When you have immunity to a virus, it is the only thing that ends that viral pandemic. Very unfortunately, with the 1918 influenza pandemic, the only way to end that viral pandemic was 50 million deaths. It was terrible because there was no vaccine. It was natural immunity and people finally, natural immunity ended the pandemic. That is not at all how you want to go. We were lucky and very grateful to get highly effective vaccines for this virus. And this is what is ending the pandemic in countries that are wealthy enough to have the vaccine, including the UK, including the US. And it will end the pandemic if we can work on global vaccine equity for everywhere else. Those are tools. This is the solution. And so that's how I respond to the three statements. And then I also want to just comment on one thing. Actually, the CDC says that in healthcare settings, we all must universally mask and we continue to mask, whether unvaccinated or not, in healthcare settings.
Dr. Gandhi, you mentioned now the question of global vaccine equity. You've recently co-authored a piece in the Washington Post uh, uh, titled uh, American Kids Can Wait. Can you explain the uh, argument you put forward and why you think it's essential and possible uh, to give tens of millions of doses to countries that are suffering massively devastating uh, effects of the uh, uh, virus in India, especially as you as you mentioned, and uh, in particular, giving uh, this vaccine to healthcare workers around the world, tens of millions of whom have not received the vaccine at all, not even one dose. Correct. So um, that was that piece was actually in the Atlantic. But um, what that piece was about, and maybe it's a theoretical argument because we're likely not to delay any vaccination for American um, children who are in a wealthy nation prior to um, uh, to poor uh, poor nations. But the argument is this is that uh, children are much, much at lower risk for severe symptomatic COVID-19 than adults. Healthcare workers in hard hit countries, even when they've had one dose of a vaccine because of limited vaccine supply, there is so many cases that they're still getting sick prior to their second dose. It is imperative to understand that we will never get to the end of this pandemic until what I just said, the solution of the pandemic is immunity. And the only way to get to, get to immunity is to vaccinate the world. We are seeing Thailand, we are seeing Taiwan, we are certainly seeing in Nepal and India that no matter what, even if you apply beautifully those five tools, mass distancing, ventilation, contact tracing and testing, the fundamental way to get through the pandemic as we watch cases, hospitalizations and deaths plummet in the United States who have been lucky enough to have the vaccine is the application of vaccine. And we cannot wait till 2023 to end a pandemic when we have the tool at our disposal. Disposal. What we were arguing for in that article is that we have surplus doses in the United States, actually all rich countries, if you really look at the global vaccine supply, have surplus doses of vaccine, even if they fully vaccinate their own population, including 12 to 15 year olds in this country. We were arguing that uh, 50 million doses could be freed up um, for other countries, even by the 12 to 15 year olds. But going back to surplus doses, even above and beyond that, we have surplus doses. The Duke Research Center estimates that by July we'll have 300 million surplus doses in this country of vaccine. We have pledged, the President Biden administration has pledged 20 million on May 17th, plus 60 million of the AstraZeneca supply that we're not going to use. That's not enough. We have more. And um, it how can we think about even global security if we want to talk about global security while a pandemic is raging elsewhere and deaths are happening elsewhere when the solution has been known and present since December. So yes, there are many ways to think about global vaccine equity. There are many other ways which we can talk about, but I can't imagine that we can ever feel at ease in this country while we're talking about masking versus unmasking. What a paradox when so many places are massively suffering without the vaccine. What about this issue of the WTO waiver? Clearly, the mass pressure from around the world and, um, and people here in this country led to President Biden saying he would uh, support a waiver um, for uh, uh, patent rights uh, at the World Trade Organization. But you have to have consensus at the World Trade Organization, and countries like Germany have said they wouldn't, which very much supports the, uh, you know, the billionaire uh, pharmaceutical companies. Can you talk about the significance of this waiver and what it would mean uh, if it were accomplished? Yes. I can't stress enough how significant I think this waiver this waiver would be and that we need to do it. So going back to 1995, the WTO put a provision in place, World Trade Organization, that in the setting of a medical emergency, that patents can be waived for life giving, essentially, medications or vaccines. And that was in 1995. I'm an HIV doctor. I've been an HIV doctor my whole life. In 1996 was the time where the US and Europe 
had access, were getting antiretroviral therapies that fundamentally changed the face of the HIV epidemic. People were literally rising from the dead. It was a time where people were so sick and could live well and long, nor normal, healthy lives with antiretroviral therapy. 1996, only the U.S. and Europe had access to these medications, while millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa were dying of AIDS. This was where the problem was most acute. Year after year, there was a discussion of let's waive temporarily the patents on these life-saving antiretroviral therapies, and year after year, the answer was no, while we watched people die in other places in the world. Finally, in 2001, by the way, Pfizer made $47 billion in 2001. That was the year that we couldn't get fluconazole, which was a very simple antifungal medication that we needed for cryptococcal meningitis, something that was afflicting AIDS patients. We have 15 seconds. Patents, okay. The point is, this couldn't be any more important, and we need to waive patents. And sorry, we do need to get national, uh, international consensus, and I hope the U.S. can persuade with an emergency meeting the European Union and Germany to do this. Dr. Monica Gandhi, we thank you again for being with us, infectious disease physician and professor of medicine at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, San Francisco General Hospital. And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Maria Tarasena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tamari, Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Adriana Contreras. Special thanks to Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman, Thermy Shake.